So we're going to move on to the next presentation um, on surgical management of pituitary tumors by Sandy Punwar. He's a professor in our department and surgical director of the California Center for Pituitary Disorders at the Brain Tumor Center. Great. So thanks a lot for the uh, introduction. I know this has been a long day for most everybody. And my <clears throat> talk is really going to be in the surgical management of pituitary tumors. Pituitary tumors are one of the most common uh, benign skull-based tumors that we have. Um, and so we can give our history a little bit of what's been going on. So my disclosures, I've got no relevant financial relationships related to this talk. So I want to give you a little bit of a history for those non-surgeons <clears throat> about the history of transmenoidal surgery. It's really a unique, unique operation. I think Dr. Theodosopoulos talked about a little bit of how we go through the nose to be able to access uh, the anterior skull base sometimes. And it actually was initially done back in 1910. It's been the hallmark of much, majority of our operations because it's such an effective and safe operation. And even back in 1910, the mortality rate that Harvey Cushing's uh, reported was 5.6%, which at that time was unheard of. Uh, craniotomy mortalities oftentimes were approaching 80%. Um, later on, Norman Dott uh, showed that there was 0% mortality amongst 80 patients and he added lighting. Uh, to the whole operation. Uh, Gerard uh, Guillaume performed over a thousand of these operations during his time frame. added fluoroscopy and some sitting. These are all sort of incremental improvements to how we access the skull base. And it didn't come back into North America till Jules Hardy came in and brought in the uh, microscope and the concept of microadenomas. And then of course, my mentor and our, our old chairman, uh, Charlie Wilson had performed over 3,500 surgeries when he really showed it's an operation where we can really impure, uh, improve cure rates, really cure the tumor, not just debulk the tumor or, 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 uh, and, and actually decrease the complications. And both really have sort of held true over time. So in, in our hands, we've kind of modified the operation in 2001 slightly. We, uh, since 2001 at UCSF, we went to a direct endonasal transnodal approach uh, where, where it really does a few things. It eliminates any anterior mucosal incision. So no, the key thing there is no nasal packings necessary. So, uh, that was one of the biggest complaints patients had. Uh, the endoscope was utilized for more complicated cases. And so far, we've got a, a history of about 2,600 direct endonasal approaches that we've been performing, where I'll give you some data on uh, the more recent uh, uh, work that we've been doing. And really, the goal is to sort of get high cure rates and lower morbidity uh, in the whole process. So just really briefly, the endonasal approach, as, as Dr. Thetisopoulos mentioned, was is really going through the nose. It's, there's, there's no real incision being made. We go back into the sphenoid sinus. The other unique thing that's been uh, happening over the last decade or so is the use of the endoscope to be able to enhance our ability to do these operations. For benign tumors, as surgeons, we, this is what we're faced with. We want to we wanna maximize uh, tumor resection because as benign tumors, if we can get a 100% resection of the tumor cells, that should be curative by definition. And so we've got this constant overlying drive to sort of say, can we cure this patient? And you can only cure a patient if you attempt to remove 100% of the tumor. If you don't, then clearly we're not gonna be able to cure them. Although some tumors, even where small fragments are left behind, they may not uh, still recur. And there are some tumors that can never be cured by surgery, even if they're benign. And I think Dr. Thetisopoulos talked about some of those already. The other aspect is minimizing complications because these are benign tumors and these patients will live on for a very long time. So any complication gets amplified by their survival. And that includes preserving or improving vision. We never want to make vision worse. Oftentimes, these tumors, as they grow, will cause vision loss. The second thing is these tumors, as they uh, expand, can actually cause uh, loss of hormones. And we want to try to preserve hormones and, in fact, sometimes improve hormones. And we'll talk about the preservation, but uh, Dr. Augie and our group actually showed that in 30% of our patients, we can actually improve the function of the pituitary gland. And although uh, hormonal replacement therapies exist, they, we don't do as good of a job as the, the, the normal gland does. And there's a Lancet paper uh, in UK looking at patients with hypopituitarism. And despite hormonal replacement therapy, the odds ratio mortality was 1.9 in these patients. So if the gland is working, we want to keep the gland working. Of course, we want to minimize risks of spinal fluid leak that can lead to meningitis. And the pituitary gland is set between the, uh, the carotid arteries and below the anterior cerebral arteries. We want to minimize arterial injury because again, these are benign tumors. So this is the balancing act that we always have of uh, maximizing resection, but really minimizing complications uh, when we can in these patients. And I talk about this in several different groups. And, and one of the factors I always think about with that influence surgical outcome is one, the surgeon patient relationship. Remember, we're not just treating a tumor, we're treating a patient. And I think that has a big impact uh, in, in this whole process. Of course, we talk about surgeon training and surgeon experience, and perhaps with skull-based surgery, as Dr. Theodosopoulos was mentioning, surgeon experience comes in uh, very heavy here. So the anatomy we're talking about that you saw a little bit about is, is the pituitary gland, which on a coronal view, you can see the optic chiasm right above the tumor, 
uh, the infundibulum and the pituitary stalk. And the most critical structure is the cavernous sinus we keep talking about uh, when we're talking about pituitary adenoma specifically, is that why can't we cure all these tumors? Well, it's because of perhaps invasion of the cavernous sinus. To a lesser degree, firmness and vascularity can have an impact, but reality is now we've got tools and techniques to be able to deal with firmness and uh, vascularities. And of course, there's always the fundamental biology of the tumor, which we're now understanding a little bit more about. So let me give you some examples uh, of what we see. This is the good. These are the microadenomas. Here's the pituitary gland on the coronal view with a small tumor in present. These really are tumors, and here's the largest tumor, but still fairly well-contained, smooth borders, it's mild optic nerve compression, gland thinned out overlying the surface, which can be preserved. These are tumors really that should be curable by mo most surgeons uh, with preservation of normal gland function. They're more difficult tumors. Um, these are very large, uh, oftentimes can be invasive into the sphenoid sinus. There's a large macroadenoma causing significant vision loss with invasion of the sphenoid sinus. Another large tumor, we can see the gland displaced towards the left-hand side, possible invasion of the cavernous sinus. Here's the carotid artery. And in fact, this tumor extends even further behind. But there's some imaging correlates that we look at. One, we can see some blood within the cavernous sinus still, which means if these, the cellar pressures are high, the cavernous venous pressures are low. If we still see blood, oftentimes that means there's no invasion. And even though the radiologists define this as invasive, invasion of the cavernous sinus, on the post-operative imaging, you can see all the tumor can be still be removed, preser preserving what remains of the gland, which is pushed over to the side here, the third nerve in the cavernous sinus now visualized. And of course, tumors that invade into the sphenoid sinus should not deter us from, from getting a gross total resection. So even these more complicated cases now, we've got surgical techniques then we can actually still cure them. And these are the ugly. These, these are the gross invasion of the cavernous sinus. And here you can see the pituitary adenoma growing into the sphenoid sinus, the gland displaced to the side, but you can see a lot of tumor extending into the temporal fossa, wrapping around the carotid artery. And so in these situations, uh, or here we can see the entire peaches portion, cavernous portion of the carotid being encompassed by tumors, even though these are benign tumors, surgically, we're never gonna be able to cure these. We need multimodal therapy for them. So complications we talked about related relationship to experience. And this was published uh, quite a while ago with Ivan Sarek in Chicago, looking at uh, national surveys. So these are self-reported. So you can, of course, you can assume there be, will be someone underreported between patient, surgeons who have done less than 200 cases, 200 to 500 cases and over 500 cases. And there was a clear trend towards decreased risks when you're talking about a greater experience. So we looked at our most recent series. This is from 2012 to 2020. Uh, a single surgeon series, so we take away, and these are only pituitary uh, lesions. These are pituitary adenomas and uh, Rathke's cleft cysts. The meningiomas, craniofemgiomas, uh, chordomas, those are uh, more complicated cases, but really this is what makes up 95, 99% of our transmenodal operations. And what we've looked at is now with over 1,100 surgeries is that uh, sinus infections still exist. However, in delayed hyponatremia, which is mild ADH is exist, but now, we're looking at is really being able to preserve pituitary functions in 97% of our patients, uh, a, a permanent DI risk of 1%, temporary just from manipulating the stock can sometimes happen, but that improves. Uh, that delayed epistaxis is actually 1.8%, not 18%, but that still exists. In fact, that's probably higher with this new approach, mainly because I think of the mucosal uh, 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 changes that we sometimes cause. But really, we can keep cranial nerve palsy, CSF leak, uh, uh, which has now we've had a very good run with. Uh, and carotid injuries to, to negligible to almost zero uh, rates and mortality uh, should uh, be kept at a very low rate as well. We've been able to do that with a very large population of patients now. And the other thing we found is that with the modifications is that we can actually get patients home quicker. In fact, now what we see is 84% of our patients are actually discharged on post-operative day number one, uh, regardless of tumor size, and then 96% uh, go home within two days. And the average duration of the surgery has not been extended. Uh, we do these uh, on average less than two hours uh, for the operation themselves. So why are there so much differences between uh, what we have done in the past and what we can do now? And, 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 and why are there so much differences between just beyond experience? What else could be going on and trying to, you know, in particular, what I'm looking at is the anterior pituitary deficiencies, uh, the cranial nerve palsies, the CSF leak uh, managements and carotid injuries. Some of this is related to understanding the anatomy, some of it's related to uh, experience, but really some of it still goes back to technique. And we've got new tools at hand, and I think Dr. Uh, uh, Theodosopoulos mentioned this, oftentimes we use the endoscope. And there's a big uh, question about microscopic versus endoscopic, and there's no question we can do more now with the endoscopic approach, but there's still some fundamental issues that we have to always keep in mind when we change our tools as to what we're trying to accomplish. 
And this is one of the uh, studies that were done with large spray stenters for throughout the United States, where they looked at uh, the two different options as far as what tools we use to be able to remove these tumors. And between the two, there was no difference between surgical outcome, whether we use the endoscope or the microscope. One of the key elements that Dr. Wilson used to always mention, and I, we can still continue to do this right now, is microdissection of a tumor. Um, sucking, scraping, pulling, tugging are not how we ideally take tumors out. We want to microdissect, and uh, that involves the large tumors. We debulk the center of the tumor and then dissect the gland, which you can see sort of compressed to the side to preserve the gland, and be able to work around the tumors using all these various instruments we have, to micronucleators, microdissectors, uh, cottonoid patties, and ring curettes, to be able to deliver the tumor away without pulling or damaging or tugging on the normal on the, the normal tissues, which are the, the gland. Perhaps that's one of the ways we can preserve the gland function and eliminate loss of anterior pituitary function or uh, eliminate the possibility of diabetes insipidus. And we can do this even with, with any size tumors. Uh, this is a 72-year-old gentleman with bitemporal hemianopsia headaches, and he was panhypopit. So once panhypopit, meaning we've lost all the hormones, the gland function is less of an issue. And now the main issue is, you know, one, getting the optic nerves out of trouble, and two is can we effectively decompress his brain uh, and perhaps even cure the tumor. And you can see this tumor, despite the fact that it's, it's multilobular, there was no gross invasion of the cavernous sinus. In fact, you can see cavernous sinus blood on both sides. Uh, there's definitely extension on the sagittal views all the way up into the third ventricle with some lobules there. But with the combination of microdissection and endoscope, again, using all the tools we have, to be able to uh, give the best results, we can still take out even very large tumors here. And you can see all the sphenoid sinus. This is uh, some scar tissue and inflammation. You can see the fat graft, which is black, and the optic nerves are completely decompressed, and the third ventricle and brain tissue completely decompressed with a complete resection, uh, despite this very large tumor. The other issue is multimodal therapy. There's, as I mentioned before, one of the key caveats of cure is cavernous sinus invasion. So how do we deal with that? We now have the tools to be able to enter into the cavernous sinus to be able to remove the tumor. So when do we sort of choose that? And what, what are the other options we have? So here's a 52-year-old woman with acromegaly. She's got a preoperative IGF-1 level of 468, normal is less than 250. Uh, the remainder of her hormone panel looked relatively normal. Um, and you can see that she's got a, not a very large adenoma um, on the left-hand side, but you can see it starts to grow into the cavernous sinus. In fact, you can almost see where the marker of the cavernous sinus used to exist before, and this tumor that is extending out actually displacing the carotid slightly more laterally. The gland is, is compressed over towards the uh, right-hand side, and of course that's something we want to preserve. So she did, you know, for most of these pituitary tumors, the primary treatment is still surgical resection, especially since we can do it so safely with uh, a relatively short hospital stay. She did undergo a transmittal resection of her tumor. There was a defect that's seen in the cavernous sinus. We started going into the cavernous sinus to be able to remove the tumor. Um, however, the tumor was very, very firm, and to dissect that away from the, uh, the cranial nerves, the third nerve, the sixth nerve, and the carotid artery at that time was felt not to be uh, worth pursuing. Uh, and she tolerated the operation well. And this is what we saw in the post-operative MRI scan. The most important thing is we were able to, these pituitary adenomas as a unique feature do not penetrate into the gland or invade into the gland. We can always develop a pseudocapsular plane to, be able to, to develop a clean plane between the gland and the, normal, and the uh, tumor itself. So there's a cavity within the uh, uh, cella. The gland had re-expanded to fill the space. Of course, you can see the residual tumor now wrapping around the uh, carotid artery. And in her case, her post-operative IGF-1 level came back to 158. So now the question is, is, what do we do? She's in remission of her acromegaly, but we know she's got residual disease. So with the help of uh, Ari Perry and, and uh, uh, others, we've kind of started a prototype or, or you know, the who designation of pituitary tumors has changed now. There's no longer a atypical version of these tumors anymore. So we look at more molecular and genetic markers. So we look at PIT1, which is a, a transcriptional factor, and it was diffusely positive. In fact, it was positive for prolactin, positive for growth hormone, positive for TSH. And the mid one index, or the labeling index, was 5.6, which is quite high for pituitary adenomas. Typical is less than 2%. So clearly in the olden days, we'd call this an atypical adenoma, but it definitely has features of a, of a plurihormonal, more primitive uh, type of tumor. So we knew that this was gonna be a more aggressive tumor and the likelihood of recurring was gonna be much higher. So going back to treating the small lesion that's on the uh, cavernous sinus, despite the fact that she's in remission, um, medical therapies we know can work for true uh, growth hormone secreting tumors and she was SR, uh, uh, receptor positive, so she could have a response to this, um, but our primary, goal was to uh, control her growth of the tumor. And so since her IGF-1 is normal, we don't have a good marker to be able to manage medical therapy. Observation could have been an op option if the pathology didn't show these atypical features, which make, made us more concerning. So in this particular case, 
we actually treated her with gamma knife radiosurgery. And this is the advantage we have with this sort of dual type approach is that by surgery, we can remove the tumor next to the gland. We know there's no microscopic disease left. So we can actually target just the cavernous sinus portion of this. And what you can see is we've got the, the gland is here, the optic nerves are well out of this area. And our goal with gamma knife is sometimes uh, to treat with high doses if we wanna get hormonal control or lower doses if all we wanna get growth control. So we hope to treat her to 18 gray, the pituitary stalk and the chiasm dose was less than six gray, which means essentially her risk for uh, optic nerve injury or pituitary dysfunction would be less than 5% for pituitary dysfunction, less than 1% for optic nerve injury. And we can do this with, we know without uh, causing risk of damaging the optic, uh, sorry, to the carotid artery or to the uh, uh, um, uh, cranial nerves that exist within the cavernous sinus. So in this situation, we expect 98 to 100% growth control rate. Uh, gamma knife is very effective in stopping growth. We'll lock in her hormones so she won't have a rise in her IGF-1 in the future. Uh, and then of course we can protect her uh, long-term without causing any long-term complications. So going back to pituitary surgery as, as itself, you know, our goals still remain the same. We decompress the optic nerves and chiasm. I think we can do this more effectively now um, with, with newer techniques. We want to preserve and improve anterior pituitary function. And really that's micro-dissecting the tumors out. That's how we've been able to improve and, and increase uh, the, the outcomes by decreasing the complications. We want to cure the tumor, which oftentimes it requires a combination of, of tools, uh, majority of small to medium to maybe even large tools. We can do it with micro dissection with extremely large irregular uh, tool uh, uh, tumors. We have to use the endoscope. And of course, for any of the non pituitary lesions, when we're extending into the brain, we can only do that by, by a, a combination technique. We want to minimize these complications, especially in this patient group, because again, these are benign tumors. Uh, they're going to have a fairly long life expectancies, and oftentimes we're doing these tumors in patients who are younger, in their second or third or sometimes fourth decade of life. And in the end, we've always got to remember we've got to do what's best for the patients. So that's a little brief cursory overview of, our, of the pituitary program and the surgical management of pituitary tumors. And as I said, we're going to be presenting more later, data later on on the molecular dynamics of these tumors and how they can impact uh, the growth rates and the, uh, the treatment options.